Today's scripture lesson is Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you form my inward parts, you cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hid from you, but I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet informed, and your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me. And as yet, when there was none of them. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we, uh, when we think about Christ, you gotta. You gotta think about family. I mean, we, we think about love and the sacrifice and stuff. Christ is family. We're family for what Christ did. And so we're gonna look at, at Christ and the cross and the tomb a little bit. But before we get there and, and talk a little bit about Mary, we have to go back to the very beginning to uh, Adam and Eve to the first marriage. That's where it all started. God was. God created Adam and looked at him and said, It's not good that Adam, that man is alone, so I need to make a helper comparable to him so he created one. And we all know the story. And then God created them together in the first matrimony called the first flesh. And, and what that really means is we have a man over here, he looks different, acts different, thinks different, feels different. He is just a different being than the woman over here who looks different, feels and thinks different. And God combined them together to build matrimony. Made one unit. Took two different beings, put them together, made one unit. One fully functioning unit. So they can function as a family. This is the head of the family. This is where the basis of the family comes from, is that in that first marriage. And then right after the marriage, uh, Adam sinned. And then right after Adam sinned, God starts speaking about Jesus. Right here in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Adam sinned, and God says, Watch out, Jesus is coming. We look at Genesis 3, chapters 14 to 15. Now, man, just seeing the serpent is still there. Genesis 3. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle. And are more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, capital He, capital H, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise His, capital H, heel. It just sinned. Serpent's still there. God said, Watch out. Christ is coming. Eve bore her first child, which was Cain, who was born second child, Nabal. Cain was a tiller of the ground, he was a gardener, a farmer. Abel tended livestock. 
came to their first sacrifice. So Cain brought his first fruits from the ground. Abel brought his first born from the livestock. God accepted Abel's gift. Refuses Cain. So Cain got angry. He murdered Abel. We all know the story. But what God's saying is man's in sin. Sin has corrupted so bad that the very first born is the very first murder. That's how far we fell. The first born is how far we fell because of sin. But there's even a bigger picture here. This is important to understand Christ. God said to a serpent, Christ is coming. His seed is going to crush you. But now God is saying, You can't come through me through the works of your hand. You have to come through me the way I ordained through the blood sacrifice. No matter what you do, it's not how much you till the ground, how much good works you do over here. I don't care if you feed a hundred people. All we get through is for blood sacrifice. And he didn't waste no time. Told the servant he was coming. And then with the first two borns, he showed us a picture of what was coming. And then he had Seth, third born. God does not focus on any more of our children. So you could have dozens, maybe a hundred children after like Seth. We don't know. God is not establishing the establishment of mankind. That's not his purpose in Scripture. The Old Testament is to prepare it. Since we failed, was to prepare us for the coming of Christ. So Seth starts the bloodline of Christ. The third born of Eve starts the bloodline of Christ. God said, I'm coming. He showed us. Third born, here I come. God from Seth comes to Noah. Noah had three sons. From Noah's son Shem comes Abraham. From Abraham comes David. From David comes Christ. Now we're going to focus on what to follow with David because there is a promise to explain how Christ came to be and, and how come he came to be. Because he got a stepfather. So we need to explain that. So we're going to go all the way to David. And God made a promise to David. It's in First Chronicles chapter 17, 11 through 12. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. That's what God told David. That's the promise. So if you want to understand how Christ got here from David, the stepfather, you have to look at Matthew. The very first thing Matthew shows you is the lineage of Christ. Before anything else in that story, Matthew is going to show you the lineage of Christ. It starts from Abraham up to David. He gets to David. He goes to his son Solomon, which was born in Bathsheba. All the way to the end of that lineage. And then Matthew said, Joseph, husband of Mary, the mother of Christ. Joseph. That is how Christ got the name Son of David. Because in Jews' time, in Jewish tradition, the guys passed down the name. So in order for Christ to get the name Joseph, he had Joseph had to be from the line of David, which Matthew explains. So now Christ is called the Son of David. And then when you look at Luke, there is another lineage in Luke. It comes after the Christmas story. It's not the very first thing. It comes after the Christmas story. And if you follow that lineage, it goes from Abraham to David. 
It's all the same. All these people are the same. When we get to David, you don't go through Solomon, it goes through Nathan. And from Nathan, you fall it out. And that's the bloodline of Mary. So Joseph and Mary both came from David. Only thing about Luke is he cannot say this is the bloodline of Mary. He had a right acceptable to the Jews. In the Jewish tradition is the only written bloodlines of men. So he put Joseph as opposed to telling it's not really Joseph. That's why he gave you the Christmas story first. So you understand first that Joseph has nothing to do with Christ. He's just a stepfather. He was married. And this is her marriage. So now we see how Christ came from David. As his name and his bloodline, as the Lord promised. Now we're getting closer to the cross. And when, and when Christ was born of Mary, Mary uh, was old woman with joy. She ran and told her cousin Elizabeth, you know, and, and she said, that, I'm just so blessed. She understood that God chose her for something. She might not have understood exactly what God chose her for, but she knew what the child meant, that, that, that this was the son of God. So imagine, I like to think when Christ was born, in that stable, and as Mary was going through labor, I would like to think the whole world was silent. I would like to think that all the animals were silent, and all the insects were silent, nature was silent, and the wind just wouldn't blow, and everything was silent in anticipation for the born of Christ. The only thing that you probably heard in the stable was the city, was Bethlehem, it was the people, because they just didn't get it. But I guarantee the world got it. And then when he, he was born, just imagine the overwhelming feeling and the dread of the responsibility to take care of the Son of God. And he's holding her and breastfeeding her. And she's looking down to this precious little face. She's looking into the face of God. That had to be the problem. I don't know if she really understood exactly what all this meant. I just know she understood it was important. And after that birth, she appeared four times before the Pentecost. And we're not going to focus too much on the others. There's one time I do want to focus on before we get to the cross. And it was the wedding feast of Cana, the first miracle. This is the second time she, she appeared in Scripture. First was when he was lost and found him in the temple. Now she's at a wedding feast in Canaan. And she walks up to Christ and said, they have no wine. And um, so we look at John 2, 4. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What does your concern have to do with me? This is the first miracle, but in all the rest of the miracles, he healed the sick, he made the lame walk, made the blind see, fed the hungry, he raised the dead. But in this first miracle, what purpose does it have? Why do you concern me with this woman? There is no purpose. How can I glorify God and my Father with this miracle? But he doesn't. He honors his mother and he does it. I like to think that we, this, you're seeing some of Mary's sin come through right here, her pride. I believe she was very proud of Jesus and where he was going and how big he was getting. And I think she, she want, went up to Jesus and said, They don't have any money. So she wanted to show him off. That's just my personal opinion. I think she's just going to show her pride. She says, this is my son. You see what he can do? Right after that, he started his miracles. This was the need of Mary. This was not the need of men. Nothing about the line of cage or fight to God the Father.
And on the third time Mary appeared after birth, uh, her and Mary and Jesus' brothers wanted to speak to him outside the multitude. And Jesus went ahead and kept teaching. He, he said, Everybody here is my mother, my brother, and my sisters. So Mary's keep popping up in the scripture, but Jesus is still laser focused. He's the Son of God. He's got a mission. He's still laser focused. And every opportunity Mary throws at him, he's going to take the teaching. I find him very fascinating on, um, on how Mary is always there in Christ. Always honors his mother, and he but he keeps focused on his mission at hand. And then when we get to that mission, this is where everything changed. Because Christ had to pull across mountain being. He had he had to carry it out there outside the city. Those fishers wasn't in the city, it was outside the city. So he had to carry his cross beam outside the city. They laid him down on the beam. He had a place marked on that beam for his wrist. But they wouldn't make it. Even in the Psalms, it says, and my bones are out of joint. I believe a Roman soldier put his foot right here pushed off and yanked to pop as far as on it being and pop and it was on the beam and they raised them up and the cross is leaning back it's not straight up it's leaning back and this puts extra pressure on the chest on the lungs so we can't breathe and his feet is nailed to the upright. All way he can breathe is push his legs up just enough to get a gasp of air. He's up there and he looks down at the foot of the cross. There's Mary. She's weeping and she's waiting. But he, he gets enough air and he looks down and says, Mother, he says, Woman, take John as your son. John, take a woman as your mother. And he took her. For probably the first time she was really gone, he was up there by, all by himself. She was always there in the background somewhere. But now he's up there all alone. Uh, in according to scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. To fill that prophecy. And he says, Abba, Abba, why have you forsaken me? Father, Father, why have you me. So now he's all alone up there by himself, no mother, no disciples, of no God the Father. And he said it's finished. And he gave up his spirit. Now it was Friday, right before the Sabbath. Jews didn't want to buy a cross, so the Roman soldiers came and broke the legs of those beside them so they could not breathe. So the fair Mathia. He wanted to bury Jesus. He loved him so, so he had to get permission from Pilate. He runs inside the city, asks permission from Pilate, Pilate grants it, and he runs back outside because it's almost the Sabbath. So he takes Christ off the, off the cross. Nicodemus brings 35 pounds of myrrh and aloe. They douse him in it hurriedly. They wrap him hurriedly. They bury him hurriedly. Mary Magdalene sees what goes on. She goes. And they took wrong spices and perfumes. And then everybody rested for the Sabbath. Christ is in the Sabbath. Then Mary and some other women, they went to the tomb at the first break on Sunday morning because the Sabbath was over. They wanted to do it right. They wanted to bury Christ right. So they went to the tomb first thing Sunday morning. So it was just breaking the horizon. He was gone. He uh, appeared to his disciples several times. He ate with them and teached them, gave them the final lessons, the final mission. He 
over 500 people. And that is where we are today. We're in the fourth Sunday of Easter. That's the Christmas story. We just glanced a little bit. I mean, that's the Easter story. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed. Um, we glanced just a little bit at the relationship of Jesus and his mother from Mother's Day. But Jesus is laser focused. He has a mission. He continues it. He's distressed through the whole time. And it says that he's distressed. He wish would hurry up. Jesus chose to be born an infant. Jesus chose to have an earthly mother. Jesus chose to go from womb to tomb. Jesus is God knows all. Jesus as man experienced our pains. If he stopped his toe, it hurt. If he failed to skin his knees. He was happy, he left, he was sad, he cried. For 33 years, he left human footprints. For 33 years, God felt human emotions. God knows and understands what we're going through when we go through it. Not just because he is our creator, all knowing and all loving, because he went through it too. No matter what life may throw at you, he is still going through with, with you too. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. Christ came because of love. He died for love. He rose for love. Mary didn't understand the full extent of what Christ was doing. The disciples did not understand, understand the full extent of what Christ was doing. And I don't think we really understood, understand fully what's going on. I don't think we can really appreciate love out of Christ. I don't think we really know what love is without Christ. It's like somebody said something mean to me, so I hate her today. Or somebody hits on you and says, oh, you're, you're handsome, I love you. Or a politician says something you don't like, says, I wish somebody would shoot you. These things are not love. These are voluntary, superficial love. It's based off of people's merits and what you think about them. Christ came for sacrificial, involuntary love. Christ died for all, of them. not one. Not somebody. Christ didn't say you have to be so and so and this cross forgives your sins. He said it's all for you. I don't care what you do, how far you fall away from me, it's all for you. Sacrificial, voluntary love. But it's up to us to accept his love. Christ offered to us his love. But it's up to us to how much we want to embrace it. Because we have worldly goods pulling at us in all directions. It's up to us to love Christ enough to overcome the worldly goods. We have to make our own choices. Christ wants us to serve people. He said, if you serve people, Christ does not talk about taking care of yourself. He's talking about serving people. You serve people, then God will take care of you. That is his message. You don't serve people because there's a benefit in it for you. 
you don't go and fill up food baskets and go to social media and says, we have fun today. And then everybody praises you and pats you on the back. Tomorrow, they don't forget all about it. But Christ said, do things in a secret because God is in secret and he will reward you openly. Love people and serve people. Do your best to be in one Christ, it's up to you. It's your commitment. How much are you willing to commit to Christ? In Jesus' name, Amen.